I want to welcome everyone to Grand Rounds and um, to our speaker today, um, Dr. Colonel Cap, uh, Dr. Sorry, Whew. Colonel Cap is um, from the, he's the director of the research at the US Army Institute of Surgical Research. And he's the hematology oncology consultant to the US Army Surgeon General. And he's a professor of medicine at the Uniformed Services in University. Um, and he has a impressive background. He received his BA from Harvard, his MS from MIT, his MD and PhD from Boston University School of Medicine, and his medicine and hemoc fellowship at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He currently serves, as I said, the director of research for the US Army Institute of Surgical Research, where he oversees a staff of over 350 personnel and manages a budget of over 55 million in executing the Department of Defense's primary intramural research program in combat casualty care. Um, he uh, is an active clinician, uh, a, a professor of medicine at the Uniformed Services University, as well as an adjunct professor of biology and an adjunct faculty in biomedical engineering at the University of Texas, San Antonio, and an adjunct professor of surgery at both the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in Houston and San Antonio. He um, served in Iraq with the Combat Support Hospital, uh, the 86th um, Combat Support Hospital, where he served as chief of medicine. He's earned numerous awards for his military service. And as I said, he currently serves as the hematology oncology consultant to the Surgeon General of the U.S. Army. On a personal note, I've got to know Andre through his work on cold store playlists, which has been a recent focus of his research team. His work is really the hallmark foundational work at which the upcoming uh, clinical trial, the CHIPS trial that Marie Steiner, who's on the call here, as well as Phil Spinell and I are co-PIs for the multi-center international trial. And it's his work that really led the way to the start of that trial. Um, and so with that, I wanna go ahead and uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Colonel Cap to present on his new trends in transfusion medicine, cold store platelets. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction, Nicole. Uh, in a sort of improvised manner. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is the second slide, too. Um, uh, so basically, you know, these are my opinions and not to be construed as official policy. The Department of the Army or Department of Defense uh, have no relevant conflicts of interest, and I'm an active duty officer of the Army. And um, thanks very much for having me, by the way, today to uh, speak with you about cold store platelets. So next slide, uh, why cold store platelets? Well, um, we do a lot of work in the DoD to try to... Um, constantly improve the care we provide to wounded service members. Um, and one of the things we do is uh, study um, why people die on the battlefield. And uh, this was a very large uh, autopsy study uh, led by Brian Eastridge and his colleagues, um, which looked at over 4,500 combat deaths. And as you can see on the slide, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of those deaths were, were not really uh, preventable, but um, <clears throat> There were, uh, in this study, about 976 patients with potentially survivable um, injuries, at least as deemed in that autopsy study. Um, and most of those uh, potentially survivable casualties were, uh, they died due to hemorrhage. So bleeding is the big problem. And uh, similar studies in civilian populations have demonstrated the same thing, that really, um, despite what we spend a lot of time training medics and, and EMTs and paramedics to do things like intubation and chest seals and all that stuff. Uh, you learn ATLS. Um, really, bleeding is a, is a big problem. Uh, I will just note that more recent autopsy studies uh, and crosswalking um, what we've learned from the autopsies with what we've learned from the DOD trauma registry is that actually, um, probably there are far fewer truly survivable or preventable deaths. Um, just as an example, you know, we, we say truncal arterial hemorrhage is, you know, a leading cause of death. 
and you think, well, you could potentially repair, you know, a lacerated um, iliac artery or something to um, our trauma hospitals downrange, um, and compare that with, you know, like what are the who gets it actually admitted to the hospital alive versus, um, you know, what's in the autopsy studies, and major arterial injuries actually pretty much never survive, uh, you know, trunk arterial injuries. So, um, so it's debatable about how many of those are truly survivable. Um, you know, I mean, the problem is people just exsanguinate too quickly. Nevertheless, even excluding those patients, um, it still hemorrhages far and away the, the number one problem. So we got better, we need better treatments for hemorrhage. Next slide. Um, and of course, this was sort of observed uh, very early on in the war in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, and um, people like my good friend Phil Spinella, that Phil just mentioned, uh, who were there at the time, started gathering data and looking at the effect of maybe transfusions have a role to play here. And on the upper left-hand corner, you see a figure from the most cited paper in the, um, you know, regarding uh, casualties in, in the recent conflicts. And, and this is one that Phil uh, wrote with uh, Matt Borgman. And basically, uh, what they found was that patients who received what was then a standard of care ATLS type uh, resuscitation involving a lot of crystalloids and, and red cells uh, with a very low utilization of plasma and a big black bar, uh, those patients uh, had very high mortality rate. And uh, where plasma was used preferentially uh, in re relation to red cells, um, you know, they had lower mortality. And so um, this kind of drove the one-to-one -one concept of, of red cells to plasma. Um, my friend Jeremy Perkins and I worked on, um, who was also there in Iraq at the time, um, on, look at the effect of platelets in the upper right-hand corner there, and you saw that basically, uh, you know, patients who received platelets in relation to red cells and plasma uh, did better as well. And this kind of drove the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one concept. Um, John Holcomb, who also served in Iraq and then uh, retired from the Army, uh, went down to Houston at the time uh, working with Charlie Wade, did this led a large uh, perspective, a large um, observational study in the civilian population and uh, basically found the same thing and that's the figure in the center uh, which looks at you know platelet and plasma ratios in relation to red cells and and so there was all this observational data basically saying hey platelets are pretty important but plasma is important you kind of want to get back to, to something that looks like whole blood and Phil has published them you know, the whole blood experience in Iraq, and, and we've followed that up with other papers. And, and so generally speaking, providing hemostatically competent resuscitation uh, was thought to be pretty important and gradually supplanted the previous standard of care, which was sort of uh, crystalloid-based. Now, you have all sort of heard that story. We're not going to talk too much about specific ratios or whole blood or whatever, uh, but suffice it to say that what we identified with this work was the need to provide uh, blood product resuscitation um, as close to the point of injury as possible, which included platelets. And as you know, standard care product makes that very difficult to do in a place like Iraq or Afghanistan. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide, please. So, um, in fact, going to this study of looking at um, even within the combat support hospital system, um, where do you get your resuscitation? Is it okay to kind of lead with crystalloid and then start with, and then, you know, start with a blood-based resuscitation in the operating room or, or later in the ICU? And what we found there was the sooner you start your, your hemostatically competent resuscitation, the better patients did. And it was in that critical first six hours that, that really made the difference in terms of survival, which since then, um, a lot of uh, data from studies like Proper and, and others have shown us that, in fact, most of the hemorrhage mortality occurs in the first uh, two to three hours following injury, and certainly within the first six hours. So this small observational study kind of presaged, uh, you know, the, the whole um, 
uh, you know, the, the work following later. But, you know, it all makes sense. You have a big hole and a bunch of vessels and, and guess what, you know, you, you bleed out pretty quickly and, and that's where the, so you have to intervene early. Next slide, please. Um, and so here's, you know, a key figure from a proper study published in JAMA in um, uh, 2015, if I recall, um, which was sort of the answer to the criticism that all this changing practice was based on retrospective data, uh, you know, observational data. And so the DOD teamed up with NHLBI to fund um, this randomized controlled trial. Um, originally, this was supposed to be a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one versus one-to-one-to-two -one versus one-to-one-to-four, -one so four red cells for every plasma and platelet unit. Um, of course, by the time and we already started enrolling in this study, um, Nobody would randomize anybody to one to one to four, so we dropped that arm, and you got what you got, which is not a lot of separation between the groups, but there was a statistically significant difference in early mortality at the three hour time point. So again, suggesting that getting blood to patients, that getting a blood based resuscitation of patients that seem statically competent was um, super uh, important. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that the one to one to two arm did end up getting sort of catch up platelets. Um, uh, clinicians treating the patients thought that they still uh, were bleeding and needed to work uh, hemostatically, uh, uh, you know, hemostatic intervention later. So, kind of supports the idea that in the early phase after trauma, when tissue is raw, you need to provide platelets. Next slide. So here's Afghanistan, and every circle is a helicopter base. It is, is the radius of a one hour flight time from a helicopter base. Um, and many of those were co located with uh, forward surgical teams. Uh, the bright white filled in circles are places where uh, casualties tended to occur. And um, you can see that in some cases, uh, you know, the, the, the circles overlay each other, but not always. Um, and so that's a problem right there. But the other problem is the big red arrow shows you where, roughly where Bagram Air Base is, and that's the only place that we had uh, platelet collection in theater. Um, and frankly, the only place we had platelets, uh, because what we were doing was we set up an apheresis team out there, and uh, we collected from the large... Uh, Donor, potential donor population at Bagram, but because of the five-day shelf life um, and the need for the incubator and the shaker and all that, uh, it really just wasn't practical to send out playlists to, you know, four surgical teams operating out of tents in these various other places in Afghanistan. And, you know, the distances are pretty big, as I'll show you on the next slide. Um, there are mountain ranges, you know, just the idea that you're going to collect at Bagram and fly platelets you know, kind of on an as-needed basis to other facilities is just not practical. I mean, it, it just doesn't work, trust me. Um, plus, there's not an infinite number of helicopters just waiting to fly platelets around. So that's, it's, it's just not going to happen. Uh, I'll also note here that, you know, it's not like we had a whole reference uh, lab out there in Afghanistan capable of doing a TTD testing. And so... Um, you know, you try to use pedigree donors as much as you can, but um, realistically, um, you know, um, we're not able to provide fully tested platelets, uh, at least prospectively tested. We, we do send samples back for retrospective testing, but that's a risk as well. So, um, bottom line is most surgical teams have no access to platelets for the rest of the war. Next slide. Just to give you another sense of how big Afghanistan is, um, there it is overlaid over the United, eastern United States. And imagine trying to provide playlists for that whole area from one site kind of near like D.C. and going all the way up into New York State, all the way down into Alabama, you know, Kentucky, India, India, uh, Indiana. Uh, it, it, it's not really possible. Um, so it's a huge problem. Excellent. Um, by the way, just to point out, I mean, I know Minnesota's a big state and um, not everybody lives in Minneapolis. Uh, basically, half the U.S. population lives over an hour from a trauma center, and trauma centers are kind of, you know, 
type of hospital where you're usually going to find full blood product uh, capabilities. And so uh, when you think about that, that basically means they live far from, um, you know, the capacity to provide a hemostatically competent resuscitation. And, you know, by the way, if you're an oncology patient and you live out of the boondocks, well, guess what? Uh, if you start bleeding there, too, uh, it may be a challenge to get your platelets. Uh, and this is all, you know, reflected in, frankly, a much higher rural trauma mortality than an urban trauma mortality rate uh, adjusted for uh, injury severity. So we have challenges in the U.S., too. Um, you know, I remember... Uh, talking about this uh, with some of your colleagues over in Milwaukee uh, a couple of years ago, and one of the uh, persons in the audience said, well, you know, <clears throat> we were able to provide uh, platelets to any hospital in, the, in Wisconsin uh, within, uh, within six hours. It's not an issue. <laughs> As you recall, uh, if you're bleeding uh, six hours, you're mostly dead. Uh, in that time frame. So uh, I'll just also share with you that, you know, South Texas, um, for a long time, we never had blood products on our helicopters. And San Antonio is sort of the, the big trauma hub for all of South Texas, which is a humongous area, as you can imagine. And uh, we did our little retrospective study. Uh, Don Jenkins led this uh, out of UT. Um, and uh, found that it turns out that patients requiring helicopter transport for trauma uh, had like a 76% mortality rate, 76%. Um, and they bleed to death by the time they get to the San Antonio. And so uh, we started putting cold blood on our helicopters and, um, and also in some of our rural uh, receiving hospitals, very small facilities. And uh, that, has gone down by more than half since we implemented that program. So it makes a difference. Uh, it really does. All right, next slide. Okay, so uh, I told you uh, probably what you already know, which is you really need to provide blood for bleeding patients. You need to get it into them early. You need to get it into them immediately as possible. Um, and when you're dealing with uh, this sort of distributed patient population over a huge area, um, that becomes super challenging. Um, and uh, remember that leading up through this period when we're developing cold store platelets, um, whole blood was, also, was, was not really an option uh, because it was thought that just like the platelets, if you store whole blood in the cold, you'll somehow kill the platelets and it won't be hemostatically competent anyway, so there's no point, so we should only use component therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was really no option to provide, um, you know, the full spectrum of, of what you need. And, um, you know, we looked at the current standard of care, and for the reasons I've discussed previously, and you know very well, um, you know, it just wasn't feasible to, to provide. And I also point out that, you know, if you consider a platelet, uh, sort of room temperature, it does develop a storage lesion over its short five-day shelf life. And in any case, you're not getting it to the patient in the first 48 hours when it's most functional because you are waiting for your bacterial testing results to come back and you've quarantined it and then you still got to ship it from your blood center to the actual hospital. So essentially, you're getting it sort of at the end of its uh, uh best hemostatic function uh, under current conditions. And extending that out to seven days uh, doesn't help you that much either because now you just got a platelet that's even less functional. Um, so what we wanted was something that had a longer shelf life uh, that was had a decent margin of bacterial safety, adequate hemostatic function. And our problem in the DOD, just like you, is that we have to operate uh, under the FDA's regulatory approval. So that was important. So what were the challenges and so what were the opportunities and the, and the challenges here? So uh, our Dutch colleagues uh, fielded cryopreserved platelets in Afghanistan, um, which we had originally developed, Bob Valeri uh, and company, uh, starting in the 1970s. Uh, great product in some ways. Um, 
you need a deep freezer at minus 65 or lower. Plus, it was not approved in the U.S. Um, we are now funding some clinical trials to test that product um, and hope to get re regulatory approval, but certainly don't have it now and didn't have it when we needed it in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, what about freeze-dried platelets? Uh, ditto, uh, not approved, currently being developed by Cellfire um, in clinical trials. Maybe it'll get there someday. I hope so. It'd be great. Uh, synthetic platelets. Uh, also potentially super helpful and interesting, currently in development, uh, not yet in patients. Um, so, you know, DOD funded a lot of work in all of these things, but it was just moving too slowly um, to make a difference uh, where we needed it. So, how about cold store platelets? Uh, Baron Hofmeister's work has certainly uh, uh, increased interest in this field, um, and Having spoken with her way back in 2008, uh, I took a look at the data and I uh, decided, you know, I think there's something to this. And uh, my team sort of launched this effort to evaluate whether this could be a useful product for the DOT. Uh, nice thing is we already got refrigerators downrange. And so that would be helpful. I mean, you know, everybody would love to get rid of the cold chain altogether, but, you know, that's probably not going to happen. So, uh, but just refrigeration is easier than trying to seal deep freeze. Uh, plus, it has the regulatory status, which was interesting. So, next slide. So, if you look at the CFR, um, there it is, Title 21, Section 640.2. Oh, there's an option to store playlists at 1 to 6 degrees. Um, kind of grandfathered in from the old days when this used to be uh, standard of care, actually. Uh, lots of discussions with, D with FDA about this. They were like, well, it's really only for whole blood derived platelets. It's really only for three days. And, um, you know, this is not really, it's not really a thing. You know, you can't just feel this. So we started studying it and uh, developing some data. Uh, to ultimately support a change in regulatory status, which we'll talk about. Now, um, the other nice thing, agitation optional, so you don't need those agitators, incubators, all that stuff. I just really facilitate uh, getting platelets out there to our people. The other thing that we were, of course, aware of is that if we found that the cold store platelets had some potential, maybe that could resurrect whole blood that you could store as opposed to strictly used on a walking blood bank basis uh, in extremis. So, next slide. Um, I'll show you a lot, sort of the data that, that led up to this decision, but basically in 2016 in CENTCOM, uh, which covers Iraq and Afghanistan, in case you're not familiar with it, the combatant command, geographic combatant command that, that sort of governs, you know, operations in that area. Um, so we started storing platelets in the cold. And we started with three-day platelets as just an experiment. And then um, we extended storage uh, based on local authority to 10 days and then the 14 days. We told the FDA what we were doing. Um, and we said, basically, we don't have any other options. And they said, OK. Um, and then in 2019, late 2019, uh, we got a variant to uh, store platelets in the cold for 14 days um, across our DOD facilities. Um, and, uh, and actually, South Texas Blood and Tissue, our local blood supplier, uh, got the same variant and has started supplying cold store platelets stored up to 14 days to uh, some of these rural hospitals I was mentioning earlier um, where they don't have platelets anymore. And by the way, in Texas, there's state law that says that any facility that delivers more than, I would say it's like 20 babies a year or something like that, at so-called level two uh, maternal uh, care facility, is required to be able to at least initiate a massive transfusion in the event of maternal hemorrhage, or postpartum hemorrhage. And, and so that means having platelets on hand, and it was just killing the hospitals because they were expiring all these platelets. And so they were thrilled at the idea of being able to have 14-day cold store platelets. And so that program, I think, is going to uh, ramp up quite a bit. Um, 
But you know, Mayo Clinic down the road from you guys uh, is uh, also using cold platelets. Uh, more on that in a minute. Uh, we have them in our trauma center at San Antonio Military Medical Center, where I practice. And uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic, basically hospitals throughout Norway, and more on Norway in a minute, um, also started using cold store platelets uh, again because of supply issues, and uh, and they've found that to work out well for them. Cold store whole blood is really taken off. I'm sure you're familiar with that, but uh, we use it throughout the U.S. military now, um, and then many other allied forces, plus uh, many trauma centers across the U.S. So the cold store platelet story and the cold store whole blood story are very closely intertwined because of that issue that, you know, everybody thought cold whole blood would be worthless because the platelets were worthless. Not so. And so we kind of got a twofer out of this uh, research effort. Next slide. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, I'll just tell you briefly about our CENTCOM experience with uh, cold platelets. Uh, we presented this to the BPAC meeting um, prior to getting our variants. Um, we had about 95 patients who uh, were treated with cold store platelets. They were also treated with room temp. So these were massive transfusion patients that got the kitchen sink. So they also got room temp platelets. So this is not a clean comparison between cold storage and room temp. It's, it's kind of a damage control resuscitation that includes cold storage versus just room temp. Um, patient characteristics were pretty similar, but, um, uh, you know, the, the reality is most of these patients were Afghans. Um, and the reason for that is that you notice we started this program in 2016 and it didn't really ramp up much until a little bit later, by which point there were very few U.S. or NATO casualties. And basically our hospitals there are there to support the Afghan National Army. So that's why all the patients are Afghans, basically. Um, let's see. Um, a lot of blast injuries, penetrating multiple mechanisms. I mean, these are really badly hurt people, no question about it. Um, the uh, the main, the bottom line is this. There is no difference in any of the safety metrics we were looking at, BTE, arterial thrombosis, sepsis, or, um, you know, those sort of things where people uh, worry about, you know, whether you're, you're, you're causing problems with the resuscitation you're giving. Uh, and there's no difference in mortality. Um, Again, small group, not a clean comparison. But our overall conclusion is, well, you know, uh, essentially damage control resuscitation containing cold store platelets had similar safety and efficacy uh, in this in this study. And um, the nice thing is that uh, the shelf life uh, made it possible to provide platelets in multiple locations, not just Bagram. And um, we had good bacterial safety data. Um, so uh, that was helpful. Next slide. Okay, so I mentioned to you we had this regulatory uh, scenario that was uh, helping us with cold store playlists. You know, only three days, uh, not great. Uh, by 2015, Jim Stubbs at Mayo Clinic has asked for a variance uh, to use the aphoresis playlists in cold storage. So that was nice, uh, precedent setting. Uh, we developed a lot of data to support use in either PATH or plasma with or without acid reduction, by the way. And we've evaluated both the um, Mirasol system for Turumo as well as Intercept and published the Intercept data recently. Um, and then we've developed data to support storage for up to 21 days, which would be even better. Um, and this is what the goal of the CHIP study really is, is to evaluate storage after 21 days because uh, for us, 14 days is nice in theater. Um, the reality is, if you collect playlists in the U.S. and you want to get them to Afghanistan, by the time they get to where they need to be, it's going to take about a week at best, right? So now you've lost half your shelf life just in getting the product there. Um, so 21 days would obviously give us more shelf life downrange, and we'd be able to supply a fully tested product, which... Up until now, we have not been able to do even with the cold store platelets. Um, so, uh, you know, to provide a, a truly safe, you know, kind of civilian standard of care product is our goal. Um, 
uh, you know, most of our, I mean, just to reassure you, most of our platelet donor range, um, you know, have been extensively tested. And, and so we, we actually haven't had a problem from platelet transfusions, which is great. Um, but in case of a large scale operation, you know, use your imagination and think China, Russia, that sort of thing. Um, I can't guarantee that we would be able to, you know, supply uh, all of our platelets from just the same, uh, you know, pedigree donors. And so we, we'd sort of open up the, the aperture a bit and then the risk would go up. So we'd love to be able to supply product directly from the U.S. that's fully tested. Um, our variant, by the way, was for the Army uh, license in 2019, the Air Force got it in 2020. Uh, I, the Navy is using intercept platelets. And so um, that took a little bit more time. I think it's still in the works with the FDA, but we're working on it. And I mentioned South African tissue as a first civilian center to get the variants as well. Next slide. Bacterial safety. Let's talk about safety first. So I kind of originally just said to folks, look, it's refrigerated. It's going to be bacteria, bacterially safe, you know, and that's why we refrigerate things. And uh, you know, Richard Penderman and others have said to me, well, you haven't proven that. I'm like, okay, really? Fine, we'll do it. We'll, we'll spike samples and we'll show you, hey, look, there's no growth in these samples. And we compared uh, pl platelet units uh, versus platelet poor plasma, um, whole blood drug platelets, apheresis platelets, et cetera, platelet release rate. Um, we won't go into why we did that. But, anyways, the bottom line is, um, you put stuff in the fridge, you can spike it with whatever you like. It's not going to grow, uh, as you can see here. Okay, now, um, well, not whatever you like. Obviously, there are some bacteria that can grow under cold conditions, but these were standard, you know, pathogens. I'll show you on the next slide. Interestingly, when we started the platelets in the plasma at room temperature, the product containing platelets actually grew more bacteria bacteria than the same plasma also stored at room temperature. And the difference is by four logs of growth, which was astounding. That was unexpected, so I'm glad we did this study. It turns out that the platelets are feeding the bacteria. And you know, you probably read that platelet granules contain some antibacterial peptides and this and that. Well, uh, the effect that, uh, the net effect of storing platelets with bacteria is that the platelets feed the bacteria. Uh, we think this is probably due to lactate production, and some bacteria really prefer uh, three carbon sugars to six carbon sugars, and so uh, that's what we think is going on. Next slide. Uh, you can see here we looked at staph epi, staph aureus, staph uh, uh, E. coli, and acinetobacter, and uh, this sort of platelet feeding the bacteria effect was really prominent in two staph species as well as acinetobacter. Um, and cold storage really shuts down the growth, but we also think that this is, um, again, this is tied back to lactate production. Um, and so in the cold, you just burn less glucose, make less lactate, and um, and you don't stimulate the bacterial growth. So anyway, uh, in case you weren't convinced that putting platelets in the refrigerator might slow bacterial growth, I hope this paper helps convince you that this might be a reasonable idea. Next slide. What about other issues of safety? People said, well, you know, cold storage activates platelets. And so they're going to be always on and increase thrombotic risk. So in our relatively limited patient population that I showed you about that had a very high thrombotic risk due to massive injuries and so forth. We didn't see that, so that's good. Um, on a more uh, mechanistic, you know, kind of uh, uh, exploring mechanisms and, and, and such level, we, we studied platelet adherence to uh, collagen under flow and see how they would respond to cross-acycline and uh, a nitric oxide donor. Um, and similar to fresh platelets, uh, both of those antagonists decrease platelet binding. As you can see in the, if you go uh, from left to right in the middle uh, squares there, the room temp platelets uh, don't stick too well to collagen, which kind of reflects that whole um, uh, problem of the platelet storage lesion. But anyway, the cold store platelets 
stuck well, and they were inhibited by prostacycline nitric oxide. Next slide. And in response to prostacycline and nitric oxide, they make cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, uh, respectively, just like other platelets. So there's some reason to think that, you know, they respond to physiologic on-off switches. Um, yeah, they're a little bit more activated than uh, return to platelets, but there at least is some uh, protective antithrombotic uh, machinery still functioning. Next slide. What about the hemostatic function? Um, so uh, we've published a lot on this topic, but basically, um, I'll draw your attention to the upper right-hand corner we're looking at Rotem data. If you look up to 21 days of storage, there's no free lunch. You do lose a little bit of clock strength, but not a whole lot. Um, by the way, plasma by itself is somewhere between 15 and 20 um, on that y-axis. So even at 21 days, you're still getting a pretty significant boost in clot strength from your cold start platelets. Um, and they generate, you know, they catalyze from generation uh, pretty well, uh, all the way out through storage, uh, similar to fresh platelets. At the bottom left corner, we looked at clot retraction. And so the way we quantified this was clot weight. So when a clot retracts, it, it, it uh, squeezes out the water. And if it doesn't retract, it's just a big blob of goo, and it's heavier. And you can see in the black bars that room temp platelets stop retracting clot after, I mean, you know, at 10 days, they're really kind of uh, highly variable. But after that, they basically can't. Um, uh, they're metabolically dead. They, they really can't generate the forces needed to retract the clot. Whereas clot retraction is preserved up to 21 days in cold storage. Um, if you look at platelet aggregation, uh, this is platelet stored and added solution. Uh, up to 22 days in this study, much better preserved than in room temperature uh, to several different agonists. Uh, as you can see, uh, collagen trap and epi here. Um, next slide. Here's dual agonist stimulation, same thing, uh, better preservation of function uh, after three weeks. So those of you enrolling patients in the CHIP study should have some confidence that the platelet should stop bleeding. Next slide. Um, there's a lot of misinformation in the literature saying that plate, old star platelets are dead somehow. We decided to try to characterize what's a dead platelet and what's not a dead platelet. So we looked at oxygen consumption in uh, the Ouroboros oximeter here. These studies replicated this work on a seahorse as well. Um, and uh, anyway, it, uh, resting metabolic function on the left in panel A, maximal response in panel B. Um, room temp uh, clearly loses that. Respir you know, loses uh, the respiration function uh, after, you know, be somewhere between five and 10 days of storage, as you can see, um, whereas it's uh, much better preserved during cold storage, which might explain the clot retraction data I just showed you earlier. That is an energy requiring process, you know, ATP, actin, myosin, the whole thing. So, uh, you know, if your mitochondria aren't doing anything, um, well, you may not be able to retract clot. Excellent. We also looked at other live, live bed sort of aspects of, um, of platelets. Uh, here we have uh, in panel A, it's uh, mitochondrial membrane depolarization. You know, the, the, the membranes do depolarize a bit over time. Uh, there's no free lunch, as I mentioned, but, um, you know, worse at room temp than in the cold caspase activation, uh, caspase 3 and 8, respectively, uh, in panels B and C. And again, you see room temp, uh, particularly in plasma, going way up uh, by 10 days uh, versus uh, really not much caspase activation in B and C. Um, we stain the platelets with spheloidin, which binds F-actin, which you should not be able to so cell impermeable dye. And so if it actually gets into the cells, that means the cell membrane is full of holes. And um, you can see room temp losing cellular membrane integrity uh, by day 10, whereas uh, it's much better preserved in the cold, panel D. 
And then finally, uh, microparticle uh, production, or microvesicles, if you prefer, um, going up in both groups, but uh, less so in the cold. So again, you know, this idea that, that okay, platelets get a little bit activated, they put phosphatidylserine on their uh, 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 outer membrane, um, you know, bind an X and five, et cetera. Uh, everybody takes that as a sign of um, cell death, ketosis. Um, but actually, it's more complicated than that with cold store platelets. Um, they definitely express PS on their outer uh, membrane, but uh, that is not consistent with um, these other markers of cellular viability, such as uh, metabolic function um, that I showed you earlier, the oxygen consumption, as well as these apoptosis markers. So, um, you know, uh, cold storage basically keeps them alive longer. Next slide. What about intercept platelets that I mentioned? Can you, can you store intercept platelets in the cold? Um, yes, you can. Um, here's their response to uh, uh, this, you know, combined agonist ADP and FD versus ADP, collagen, and arachidonic acid. Uh, you can see that there's, they do take a bit of a hit. Let's, let's face it, the intercept process is not totally benign to the platelets. Um, and all that extra manipulation uh, shows that they really lose function by day 21. So I, I think unmanipulated platelets will probably take 21 days of cold storage and still provide some reasonable hemostatic function. Intercept platelets, I think you can probably do 14 days. I might not push it beyond that, but um, maybe we'll see some of that in the CHIPS trial. Um, and perhaps, uh, perhaps that's wrong. But we'll see. Next slide. Um, so this is Rotem, same thing on the um, on the uh, uh, intercept platelets. And you can see that the, by day 21, the um, cold stored intercept platelets are uh, just barely providing a little bit more clot firmness in the upper left corner than uh, what you get from plasma alone. You know uh, that. Sub-10 MCF just reflects uh, purely the fibrinogen uh, contribution of clots. So, um, we'll see. But they may not, they may, I think intercept is probably a 14-day proposition at best. Next slide. Uh, here's just some more data from the intercept study looking at clot retraction. Kind of the same thing. Uh, you're starting to lose clot retraction by day 14 uh, in the intercept treatment platelet. The black bars, I should have said, are the control uh, uh, platelet units. Um, okay, next slide. So what about whole blood? Just real quick here, um, we looked at the effect of cold storage on whole blood. In this study, out to 21 days in CPD, we also studied out to 35 days in CPDA. Um, you definitely see a drop in platelet aggregation, as you can see on the panels on the left. Um, but it's better preserved in the gray bars, which are cold, compared to the black bars, uh, which are um, room temp. Um, there are two different gray bars. One of them is for uh, untreated, and the other one is for Mirasol pathogen reduction uh, system treated, the riboflavin in UV. And um, there's really not a whole lot of difference. So the riboflavin didn't uh, significantly, riboflavin in UV did not significantly change the hemostatic function of cold stored whole blood. Um, I don't know if that system is ever going to see the light of day, but there it is. Bottom line is this supported the work, or was complementary, if you will, to the work that we've been doing on cold stored platelet units as a component therapy. And this helped convince people that, you know what, maybe the cold stored whole blood is actually a reasonable all-in-one hemostatic product for trauma resuscitation or bleeding patient resuscitation and uh, help get it back out there. Next slide. So uh, I showed you some of the material that, that we've published over the years and others have published. We look at all kinds of different aspects of uh, hemostatic function, live dead. Um, we've looked at in vivo hemostasis using intravital microscopy, published that paper in GTH showing that the cold store platelets, you know, where it, it, don't adhere under normal conditions. And then when you do a laser injury, you have a blood vessel, they stick uh, and participate in clot formation. Um, we uh, have also looked at this in 
the clinic. Not just in that observational study I showed you, but I'll show you a few slides in a second here. Next slide. Um, as I said, not just our group doing this. Lots of people have looked at cold playlists over the years, and most people who have looked at it have concluded that, yeah, you know, hemostatic function is better uh, preserved in the cold. Next slide. Um, as an example of that, this is work done by Lacey Johnson and Denise Marks and colleagues uh, by the Australian Red Cross. Um, they compared room temp buffy coat irradiated platelets, uh, room, you know, room temp versus cold stored. And they also looked at cryopreserved. And what you see is that, again, cold stored uh, does great uh, in hemostatic function, um, better preserved aggregation than room temp. Cryopreserved doesn't really aggregate, uh, but it does contribute to ramen generation and even a bit to clot strength. So uh, that might be a viable product at some point uh, if we can get that approved. So anyway, interesting data there. Next slide. Now, what about the clinical data? So this is a figure from a recently published in anesthesiology a study that uh, uh, our friends, uh, Gary Strandinus and, and colleagues, uh, performed out in um, uh, Norway. Um, and uh, Phil Smell and I were um, contributors to the study as well. And uh, this kind of inspired the CHIPS trial, uh, as Nicole was mentioning earlier. And so you see here we did uh, randomized rim temp to cold stored over seven days and then had an additional uh, arm added to the study, single arm um, observational uh, out to 14 day storage. This is uh, chest tube drainage um, at, uh, you know, basically the, the day following uh, cardiac surgery. And, um, I think the data speak for themselves. I mean, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I'm just saying that they're pretty comparable. Um, so uh, it, 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 I think it, it lays a good foundation for a larger, uh, more definitive study like CHIPS um, certainly provides rationale. Next slide. Uh, this is platelet aggregation data from the patients getting 14-day cold storage platelets. Every line is a different patient. And um, this is pre and post transfusion. Now, bear in mind that if they're not, this is not measured pre and post the transfusion of the unit of platelets, but of the whole gamish of what they're getting the red cells, the plasma, the platelets, the whole thing. And nevertheless, uh, so it's, you know, it's a dirty signal, is what I'm saying. Um, and it's not a huge number of patients, but most of the lines are going in the right direction, which um, is. Uh, I think encouraging again uh, and supports a, a larger definitive study. Next slide. So, what are our future directions in the DoD? Well, we are funding the CHIPS trial because what we'd really like to see is a 21 day product that would allow us to ship from the US to wherever we needed to go and provide, uh, uh, you know, a, a hemostatically competent resuscitation to combat wounded. Um, we'd love to see the information, uh, the instructions for use on all the apheresis bags and systems to say store at room temp or cold. Um, and full licensure for everybody to have access to this product. So that's another goal of the CHIPS study. Um, and basically, uh, we hope that this product will help people who are bleeding um, either downrange or in rural Minnesota. Texas or wherever they are. It doesn't have to be rural. Honestly, it could be in your emergency department um, or a trauma uh, surgery uh, theater. Next slide. Um, here's an interesting take on cold store playlists from uh, a good friend, Jim Studd. Uh, so, Jim and colleagues have been working on this problem for several years, and uh, during COVID, they really were worried about their platelet. Uh, inventory and say, so, so you know what we're going to do? We're going to take intercept platelets, use them for up to five days as standard intercept room temp platelets for our hemoc patients, whatever. And then we're going to put them in the fridge and store them out to 14 days and have something available for uh, our trauma patients, surgical patients, what have you. And they told the FDA they were going to do this. The FDA said nothing. And so they said, great, uh, we'll take no as a yes, or we'll take nothing as a yes. And um, 
<laughs> and go forth uh, and, and do this. And so they just published this in Transfusion um, like a month ago, I believe. And, uh, and actually, the Australian Red Cross had kind of pioneered this as well, published in Vox in 2018, where they said, hey, you can do this with Buffy Coat platelets. They put them in the room temp at first, and they put them in the cold, and they think their platelets are, those, those were also irradiated platelets. Bottom line is, according to Jim, you know, I mean, it's a small patient cohort here, 40 patients, but, you know, using a bunch of different indications, um, bacteriologically, uh, you know, a safe product. Um, the surgeons love them, no issues, no increased bleeding, no change in platelet consumption, suggesting lack of function and so forth. So this is another possible avenue uh, that, that folks can think about implementing. Next slide. So, uh, you know, we've been working on this for a while. Um, I thought it would be the easiest thing in the world to just do a few studies, show that the cold platelets were functional and get them out there. Um, it took a lot longer than I thought, but it got there anyway. Uh, in 2019, I was studying for my team research uh, boards, and I'm reading the ASHSAP picture here, and in the transfusion medicine section, I see this thing on cold stored platelets, which kind of blew my mind. Um, but uh, I guess it's if they've made it into board prep material, maybe they're here to stay. Um, uh, or they're back again, because as I mentioned, this used to be uh, the way we stored platelets back in the 60s and uh, through much of the 70s. Uh, so, next slide. And with that, uh, happy to take your questions. Sorry, we don't have a huge amount of time, and sorry for the technical glitches here. Uh, but thank you for your uh, attention. Excellent presentation, Andre. Anyone have any uh, questions for? Our speaker. Uh, yes, Nicole, this is uh, John Crossan. I noticed on uh, one of your uh, slides that you commented on uh, transacamic acid uh, not uh, being any different between cold storage and, and, uh, and room temperature storage. Um, because uh, most of the patients actually got transacamic acid. How, how long have you been using transacamic acid routinely in the field? Um, well, that's a complicated question. So Crash 2 published back in uh, 2010, I think it was, sorry, something like that. Um, we took a look at it um, immediately, concluded that this was probably a good thing to do. Our British colleagues uh, operating out of Camp Bastion in Helmand Province have been using it. Um, and uh, so we theoretically initiated it, I want to say in 2011 or 2012, uh, actually fielding it, especially in the pre-hospital setting, took quite a bit longer. And um, uh, mostly, uh, the big challenge has been, honestly, that we, we adopted the sort of evidence-based approach of, well, you know, this is how they gave it in crash, too. One gram over uh, 10 minutes by, you know, uh, slow um, IV push or, or by some infusion of that on an ML bag followed by an eight-hour infusion. Um, try doing that without an infusion pump. It doesn't happen. So we've looked at our utilization rate and of patients that in our clinical practice guideline would be eligible for getting TXA. Um, only 7% have actually got it pre-hospital um, because it's just, it's just impractical. Um, so actually, we've changed our recommendation to just give a two-gram bolus uh, up front uh, because, you know, if nobody's getting it, what's the point? Um, and uh, and even once they got to the hospital, there's always a lot of confusion. They get the TXA, they not get the TXA, there's delays. Well, they didn't get the TXA, it turns out we finally talked to the medic. Oh, well, now it's more than three hours since injury, so, yeah, okay. Um, I would say that as people have gotten more familiar with it and comfortable with it, people are using it more, but... Um, its use has been greatest in the special operations community, which is, of course, 
where we're taking most of our casualties these days because we don't have large combat operations ongoing. The people who do go into combat mostly are in the soft community. Um, they use it pretty routinely. Um, and actually, the Ranger Regiment, you know, sort of came up with this protocol of taking uh, an intraosseous access device and then flushing it with the TXA bolus, um, which, you know, it turns out uh, has worked well for them. So that's what we're doing now. But yeah, for uh, severely injured patients, basically everybody got TXA. Fine. Hi, this is Claudia Cohn. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I have a question about harvesting the platelets. How soon you feel you need to get them into the cold? Will is there an important difference if they're harvested and immediately put into the cold, or um, you can have a unit that's day three um, room temperature and then you put it into the cold? So um, the practicalities of this are kind of interesting. Like we've we've tried this in the lab, um, and we've found that the sooner they go in, the better. Um, when we got our variants from the FDA, the FDA was adamant that they would allow us to do this and put their name on it, if, if you will, uh, only if you got it into the cold within two hours of collection. We argue that that didn't make a lot of sense because, for example, for liquid plasma, the standard is four hours. Uh, they didn't want to hear it. They said two hours. And I think there's so much sensitivity around the bacterial safety issue that that was the story. Now, for the CHIPS trial, um, we made the point about intercept platelets that that's just not going to happen. And they said, okay, for intercept platelets, you know, you put them in there after the intercept treatment. Um, and I forget what the hours, what, what, what the, I think it was eight, was it eight hours? Nicole, maybe you remember um, from Marie. It's eight, but we're going for four. So they're shooting for four. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so that, now, from a functional standpoint, what does it do? I, we found that results are better when you put them in earlier. Uh, Jim has not done an extensive, Jim Stubbs has not done an extensive characterization of his, you know, storm for five days at room temp and then put them in the cold for nine days uh, platelets. Uh, the paper in box that I cited from uh, Lacey uh, Johnson and colleagues, they actually did look at function and they said, well, pretty well. I don't remember exactly, you know, what the nuances were between the two groups. Um, faster is better, <laughs> you know, less will chance for bacteria to grow, better preservation of function, bottom line. Um, but you still get some reasonable function, apparently, even if you wait five days, at least for intercept platelets. So I think it all depends on what exact product you're talking about. Okay, we do have a 9 a.m. quality meeting. I want to thank everyone, um, especially Dr. Cap, um, for joining us this morning. So um, we hope everybody is fine, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right, thank you.